W5. A grisly discovery. Investigators say they need the public's help on this one. Reveals a horrific crime. So she died like a dog. Sending a seasoned detective on a search for justice. Police believe some member of the public knows who this girl is. W5, with an investigator's inside view of the short, battered life of an innocent child. What's missing for our system? She had no one to turn to. Terrible neglect suffered at the hands of family. The worst case of child abuse this country has ever seen. And the break in a long, grim case. She said, I want to talk about a girl. That may lead to a killer. Did you kill your daughter? And a natural performer, a gifted vocalist. She was just a singer. She loved to sing. Praised by her peers. Serena Ryder. Adored by her fans. I always wanted to be a musician and to play in front of as many people as possible. A rising superstar struggling under a dark cloud. I just felt really separate from myself. Morella Fernandez explores Serena Ryder's descent into illness, her struggle back to the spotlight. You got the fire water running through you. I feel like I'm less afraid to play around with things now. And her new hope for the future. Just do what you love and then everything's going to be great. Here is Kevin Newman. Hello, and thanks for joining us. It was a crime so disturbing, even the homicide cops investigating it were shaken to their core. For Detective Sergeant Steve Ryan, solving the murder, which became a 20-year cold case, became personal. Well, Steve has now retired from the Toronto Police Force, and he's now a crime commentator on our sister station, CP24. Well, now for W5, Steve revisits his investigation that still haunts him to pay tribute to the teenage girl whose short life was such a horror. It started with a burning suitcase. September 1st, 1994, 3 a.m. A police officer is patrolling an industrial area just north of Toronto when he spots what seems to be a tire fire. When the flames are out, it's obviously a lot more than a burning tire. Inside the burnt out suitcase is a body. A post-mortem reveals a few facts. The victim was a teenage girl, five foot two, and horribly malnourished. She weighed just over 50 pounds, the weight of a typical eight-year-old. And she suffered. She had 21 recent broken bones. What police didn't know was, who was she and what happened to her? Back in 1994, I'd been a cop for less than four years. I vaguely remember seeing the news about a girl in the suitcase. What I didn't know was it would become the case that would haunt me for the rest of my life. It was just something I just couldn't get my head around. I've seen a lot of um, hor horrendous crimes, but this one for me, this finished me as an investigator. My colleagues went all out to identify the girl, starting with a press conference to troll for leads. It's pretty basic clothing, and we don't think it's high-end type of clothing. Police believe some member of the public knows who this girl is. But nobody came forward. A search of missing person files failed to turn up any leads in this case. A year passed, and they tried again, this time with an artist's sculpture. Those are her actual teeth. The actual skull is underneath this. And some guesses about her heritage. The female is either Ethiopian or Somalian. Still, no one recognized her, and the unknown girl and the secrets of her death remained unknown. We just haven't had any success whatsoever. Thousands of kilometers south in Kingston, Jamaica, a mother was trying to solve a mystery of her own. Her daughter was missing. Opal Austin lives in the South Kingston slum. In the early 90s, her house was filled with five kids she was raising on her own. Melanie was 13 and loved to read. Tell me about Melanie. Oh, Melanie was a quiet person, more reserved. Melanie never used to give problem, no trouble. And that was Melanie. Melanie's younger brother, Dwayne, was 12. He was a great singer and loved to make people laugh. Tell me about Dwayne. Lord, Dwayne was um, 
energetic person, he was a jolly person, friendly, and so if he come around you, you wouldn't want him to leave. The five kids lived with Opal in this crowded shack. Back then, it had a dirt floor and no windows. Houses here are made from salvaged wood and steel. No running water, no plumbing. Was the place like this when Melanie and Dwayne lived here? Yeah. Where did they sleep? Let me sleep with me, sometime out here. Is this the mattress that they would have slept on? Yeah. Opal's ex-husband, Everton Bittersing, was Melanie and Dwayne's father. He'd moved to Canada 12 years earlier to find a better life. Now, in 1990, he was back with an attractive offer for a poor woman with five kids. Let Melanie and Dwayne come live with him in Canada. Why do you think it was a good idea to have Melanie and Dwayne go to Canada? Well, people, they tell we must make them go on. When I tell them that the father go and help them, people used to say it'll be better, better off for, for the children. Everton had seven children from four different women. But now that he'd moved to Canada, Opal believed that he'd settled down. And his new wife seemed like a good parent. As a mother, you know, she was very um, strict and protective of our children. So you saw Elaine as a good yes, mother? As a good, yeah. And you didn't have any difficulty sending your children no, to, to no, Canada? No, 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 no. Was that a tough decision for you to let your two children go live with their father? Hard, it hard. Because see, they, them leave and gone. I'm leave the same place. In 1991, Melanie and Duane moved 3,000 kilometers north to this building in Toronto. They were joined by another one of Everton's Jamaican-born children, 17-year-old Cleon. The three Jamaican kids soon had three Canadian-born half-siblings, eight people in a one-bedroom apartment. Still, it was better than what Opal could offer in Jamaica. So this is where the phone booth used to be when you made all those phone calls. Yeah. That phone's gone now. But Opal's memory is fresh. Despite making dozens of collect calls, she was only able to talk to her children twice. Anytime Everton answered, he usually had excuses. We start to talk about the children. Yeah. And he would say that they're going to them gone to school. You believe them? You still believe what he's saying to me. But Everton was lying. Records show the kids were never enrolled in a Canadian school. Eventually, Everton stopped taking Opal's calls saying they were too expensive. For about a year, Opal lost all contact. Then, in June 1992, she got an urgent message to call Canada immediately. When she reached Everton, he told her something horrible. Their son, Dwayne, was dead. You learned that Dwayne has died. Everton told her Dwayne had jumped from their 22nd floor balcony because he thought his father was going to send him back to Jamaica for bad behavior. Opal couldn't believe it, but the police did. Dwayne's death was ruled a suicide. And when Dwayne died, I went to Minister of Fears and tell them that I want back my daughter. And then after that, I get a letter from them say that Melanie is okay. She's doing fine. She's going to school. Is that the letter? Yes, I eat. Uh... In fact, in the letter, I think it says Nolan is very happy. Yeah. Opal believes that letter was based on lies that Everton told Jamaican officials. And then Everton and family moved away without telling Opal where. How long is it? Maybe about three, four years. It was a long time. Were you still trying to call Melanie? No, no. Um... We never have no number. The last number to them, it ring without an answer. Years passed with no word from Canada. Then one day in the late 90s, Everton and Elaine showed up in Jamaica. They'd moved back without Melanie. Did you speak with Elaine and Everton? Yes. When I asked them what happened to Melanie, they say, Melanie, run away. They say she run away in America. She had no clue where in America or how to find her. Opal had no money, no connections, and no resources. This meant that she had no realistic chance of finding her daughter. So she did the only thing she could think of, which was desperate and futile. 
Opal used to work at this coconut stall that catered to tourists. And when American tourists used to come by to buy things from you, um, they used what to did you come do? and buy jelly coconut, and they would buy uh, drinks from me. So I would take out the picture out of my bag and show them. So because you believed that Melanie ran off to the United States, yeah. you would ask every American you could yeah, see if they yeah. knew her. Yes, but it never worked out. Five years passed without word. Ten years passed. Seventeen years after Melanie disappeared. Pastor Eduardo Cruz was baptizing his flock in St. Catharines, Ontario. Among those he baptized was a couple who never missed Sunday service, Everton and Elaine Bittersing, who'd moved back to Canada. They were unforgettable. She was pretty emotional when she worshiped. She'll raise her hands and she'll yell, hallelujah, and she'll move from one back to the other bank. You know, her husband would just look at her and, and laugh. I would say probably mocking her, just laughing at her and saying that, she was stopped probably crazy. Praise the Lord. Elaine often lingered after service to ask the pastor for grocery money. But one day, she had something else on her mind. When everybody left, she said, Pastor, can I talk to you? And I said, sure, what is it about? And then she said, I don't want Everton here. So that point, I told Everton, Everton, could you please uh, leave the sanctuary and wait for me behind the glass doors? He said, yes, pastor. So I said, sister, what do you want to talk about? She said, I want to talk about a girl. I said, what girl? A girl that Everton killed. A victim's brief, troubled life. The system failed her. As we uncover a family's violent past. Everton needs to beat me a lot, okay? When W5 continues, In 1994, a teenage girl's broken, starved body was found in a burning suitcase north of Toronto. Investigators say they need the public's help on this one. And despite police efforts, she remained unidentified for 17 years. If God was able to change my life, why he would be able to change yours? Pastor Eduardo Cruz is a St. Catharines, Ontario preacher. One of his flock, Elaine Bittersing, was about to make a shocking confession and Elaine tells you that she has something that she wants to say to you. Tell me about that. She said, this girl named Melanie, um, Everton had her in a room, a girl that Everton killed. How, how did they kill her? Well, he kept her in a room until she died. No water, no food, no nothing. And when I tried to feed her, he beat me. So she died like a dog. Did Elaine ask you for forgiveness? Yes. And all of a sudden she said, hallelujah. You know, she like screaming, like something came out from her and just got rid of whatever was freaking her. Elaine may have felt relief, but Pastor Cruz was scared and shaken. He searched the internet to see if her story matched any news, but could find none. Then he called the police. Pastor Cruz was crucial to this investigation because if he did not report this to the police and he kept this to himself, this case would remain unsolved. I'll never forget the date, November the 28th, 2011. I came into my office and there was a fax on my desk and it talked about possible information with regards to a homicide in 1994. It was a huge break and I needed to hear it myself from Elaine. This is the video of our first meeting. This is the purpose of this interview. The time is 10.45. During our four-hour interview, Elaine said Everton was violent and frightening. Everton used to beat me a lot, okay? Because that's where I, I, I start to get accustomed to um, being afraid. There are many, many occasions I tried to uh, get away from Everton, like divorce-wise, and it just wouldn't work. Elaine presented herself as a victim very soft-spoken, very apologetic. And she said she wasn't the only one who was scared. Was Melanie afraid of her father? Yes, she was afraid. Yes, she was. He talked to her a few times, too. He went, sorry? He talked to her a few times, too. She said Everton wouldn't feed Melanie and forced her to live in this closet. Did you see Melanie in the closet when she died? Yeah, I did. When I asked her how a 17-year-old could just die, she said she didn't know. 
but thought it might have to do with how little she was given to eat. What does her body look like, the state of her body? She was thin. Maybe she was getting enough food. Elaine admits it was her idea to put Melanie in a suitcase, inspired by something she saw on TV. But she said it was Everton and Melanie's half-brother Cleon who got rid of the body. She repeatedly mentions that she wants a promise that she won't be charged. I don't want to be charged for nothing, OK? I tell her that's not possible. When we finished talking, since she wasn't under arrest, she was free to leave. Well, I appreciate your time. You know, it's been a long, a long day. Yeah. But a day later, I talked to the Crown attorney who said, charge them all. So we charged Elaine and Everton with assault and failing to provide the necessaries of life. And we also charged Everton's son, Cleon, for helping to get rid of his half-sister's body. The videotape is on. This is being recorded, OK? <laughs> Everton was now in custody. And in his interrogation, I laid out just how serious the charges were. You could be charged with murder, depending on what we learn, OK? For what? I mean, <laughs> did you kill your daughter? No way. Did you ever hit her? Who killed her? I really don't. Who killed her? If it wasn't you, who killed her? At one point, it sounded like Everton might have something to confess. I made a mistake. Tell me about your mistake. The mistake is to bring them from Jamaica. But over several hours, he confessed nothing. Though he did offer me some advice. Officer, get your information good, sir. Because God is watching you too. Do a good job. I'm trying. Now, it was time to talk to Everton's wife, Elaine, again. But this time, she wasn't a witness. She was a suspect. It was obvious her mood had changed. Elaine, the charges you're facing right now are horrendous. They're very serious. Yeah, I understand that. But guess what? There is a God who is, who is bigger than all those charges. OK? Because God knows I didn't do anybody anything, so I don't know anything. When I asked her about Melanie's injuries, she swore she had no idea her stepdaughter was even hurt. Excuse me? Melanie had very bad injuries. What do you mean by Melanie had very bad injuries? I don't understand you. What don't you understand? No, honestly, what do you mean she had bad injuries? The worst injuries that I've ever seen on one person in my all my years of doing detective work. The worst. No! <laughs> Melanie's body was left in an abandoned area and set ablaze in a suitcase that you suggested they put her body in. You did that. You made that suggestion. I need to know why. Elaine insisted she lived in fear of Everton and never called police because she didn't trust they'd do anything. Oh, my God. With no confession and little new information, there was just one person left to interview. Cleon. Melanie's half-brother lived in the apartment with Melanie until she died. And he was about to tell a shocking horror story of abuse. Cleon's recollection of what happened was, was crucial to this entire investigation. In essence, our eyewitness, he was involved in the, in the entire incident. He saw what happened to Melanie. He heard what was said by um, Elaine and by Everett Everton to Melanie. So the scenario that Cleon uh, described was was that of of a, a horror film? Melanie would would, would be uh, yelled at, and Everton would beat her. Her dad would beat her. He would flush her head in the toilet. He stomp on her as she's on the ground. He'd stomp on her with his foot. She she wasn't allowed to eat. They made her live on the balcony for the most part. She was forced to go to the bathroom in a bucket. She slept on the piece of carpet in the living room. There were times where they would put her in a closet and she would be forced to stand in that closet for long periods of time as punishment. Cleon's last memories of Melanie in that apartment were basically lying on the floor, dragging herself across, the, across it. Based on what he told us, the charges against Cleon were stayed and we charged Elaine and Everton with murder. For the first time in nearly 20 years, I told the world the unknown girl in the suitcase had a name. Her name is Melanie, and she was 17 years old at the time of her death. Everton's trial was first, and he pleaded not guilty. 
Elaine testified against him. Now, Elaine was out of custody. She was released on a bail. She would walk past me every morning going to court. Some morning she'd say hello to me. She put a curse on me, she said a couple of times as she walked by. It was, it was bizarre. Everton didn't take the stand, so Elaine's and Cleon's narrative were the only ones entered into evidence. Two pathologists revealed something new and shocking to the public. Melanie was likely drowned. After a three-month trial, Melanie's mother, Opal, was there to hear the verdict. It took jurors just four hours to find Everton Bitterson guilty of first-degree murder in the death of his daughter, Melanie. Her mom now knows uh, what happened to her, and her dad is about to uh, you know, be punished for what he did to her. Elaine's trial was next, with the same conclusion. The jury found today that Elaine Bittersing was complicit in the murder of her stepdaughter and is what is being called by many the worst case of child abuse this country has ever seen. Elaine was the instigator. Elaine knew that Everton would beat Melanie, and Elaine was present for those beatings. Elaine was present when she was chained. Elaine was present when she was put in the closet. When the final verdict was read with Elaine Bittersing's conviction for second degree murder, I was done. I, that case finished me off as, a, as an investigator. I have never seen anything like the abuse that was inflicted on Melanie. For me, the worst part of this case is it could happen again. We cannot have children being held captive and nobody knows that they're here. We have no choice but to put something in place where there can be some follow-up and we can make sure that the kids are okay. When Melanie came to Canada back in 1991, there was no system to make sure that she was in school or healthy. There still isn't. I'm one of those children that came to this country from Jamaica. Michael Thompson came to Canada when he was 11. Now he's a Toronto City Councillor who wants to set up a national child registry to track and monitor immigrant children to ensure they're safe. What's missing from our system that allowed for this to happen right under our noses? She had no one to turn to and no one knew her circumstances didn't know any about her whereabouts. She wasn't going to school. She wasn't connected with anything in the community. She had no friends. The system failed her. If we fail to establish a national registry to help protect our children, then I think government is failing our society as a whole. Thompson has met with federal officials and says they support his plan. But the federal immigration minister wouldn't commit to talking to us about it. Both Everton and Elaine have appealed their convictions. Back in Jamaica, Melanie's mother can't shake her grief. What has this done to you? Oh, God. My body just so weak, me sick. Sick, sick, sick. Me just I try to put the best outside. She thinks that if her kids had stayed with her, they probably would not have escaped the poverty that awaited them. But poverty is better than what they got. Do you ever think what would have happened if you didn't send them to Canada? Did you ever think about that? Them would be alive today. We know that. Well, in retelling Melanie's story, Steve and our W5 team requested a jailhouse interview with Elaine Bittersing, and she agreed to it. But on the day we showed up at the Grand River Prison in Kitchener, Ontario, she changed her mind. She's now one year into a 25-year life sentence. Here's what's straight ahead. A childhood filled with music. I was so intent on singing all of the time. Sets a course for a natural performer. Because she has an amazing voice. When W5 continues.